Part 1 of Ball of Fat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ball of Fat by Guy de Maupassant. Translated by M. Walter Dunn. Part 1. Read by Michael Robinson. Carbondale, Illinois. For many days now the fag end of the army had been straggling through the town. They were not troops, but a disbanded horde. The beards of the men were long and filthy, their uniforms in tatters, and they advanced at an easy pace without flag or regiment. All seemed worn out and back-broken, incapable of a thought or a resolution, marching by habit solely, and falling from fatigue as soon as they stopped. In short, they were a mobilized Pacific people, bending under the weight of the gun, some little squads on the alert, easy to take alarm and prompt an enthusiasm, ready to attack or to flee, and in the midst of them, some red breeches, the remains of a division broke up in a great battle, some somber artillerymen in line with these varied kinds of foot soldiers, and sometimes the brilliant helmet of a dragoon on foot who followed with difficulty the shortest march of the lines. Some legions of freeshooters, under the heroic names of Avengers of the Defeat, citizens of the tomb, partakers of death, passed in their turn with the air of bandits. Their leaders were former cloth or grain merchants, ex-merchants in tallow or soap, warriors of circumstance, elected officers on account of their escutions and the length of their mustaches, covered with arms and with braid, speaking in constrained voices, discussing plans of campaign and pretending to carry agonized France alone on their swaggering shoulders, but sometimes fearing their own soldiers, prison birds that were often brave at first and later proved to be plunderers and debauchees. It was said that the Prussians were going to enter ruin. The National Guard, who for two months had been carefully recointering in the neighboring woods, shooting sometimes their own sentinels, and ready for a combat whenever a little wolf stirred in the thicket, had now returned to their firesides. Their arms, their uniforms, all the murderous accoutrements with which they had lately struck fear into the national heart for three leagues in every direction had suddenly disappeared. The last French soldiers finally came across the Seine to reach the Ottomar Bridge through saint Sever and Bourg-Achard, and marching behind, on foot, between two officers of ordnance, the general, in despair, unable to do anything with these incongruous tatters, himself lost in the breaking up of a people accustomed to conquer, and disastrously beaten in spite of his legendary bravery. A profound calm, a frightful, silent expectancy had spread over the city. Many of the heavy citizens, emasculated by commerce, anxiously awaited the conquerors, trembling lest their roasting spits or kitchen knives be considered arms. All life seemed stopped. Shops were closed, the streets dumb. Sometimes an inhabitant, intimidated by this silence, moved rapidly along next the walls. The agony of waiting made them wish the enemy would come. In the afternoon of the day which followed the departure of the French troops, some Uhlans, coming from one knows not where, crossed the town with celerity. Then, a little later, a black mass descended the side of St. Catherine, while two other invading bands appeared by way of Darnatal and Boigualame. 
the advance guard of the three bodies joined one another at the same moment in hotel de ville square and by all the neighboring streets the german army continued to arrive spreading out its battalion making the pavement resound under their hard rhythmic step some orders of the commander in a foreign guttural voice reached the houses which seemed dead and deserted while behind closed shutters eyes were watching these victorious men masters of the city of fortunes of lives through the rights of war the inhabitants shut up in their rooms were visited with the kind of excitement that a cataclysm or some fatal upheaval of the earth brings to us against which all force is useless for the same sensation is produced each time that the established order of things is overturned when security no longer exists and all that protect the laws of man and of nature find themselves at the mercy of unreasoning ferocious brutality the trembling of the earth crushing the houses and burying an entire people a river overflowing its banks and carrying in its course the drowned peasants carcasses of beeves and girders snatched from roofs or a glorious army massacring those trying to defend themselves leading others prisoners pillaging in the name of the sword and thanking god to the sound of the cannon all are alike frightful scourges which disconnect all belief in eternal justice all the confidence that we have in the protection of heaven and the reason of man some detachments rapped at each door then disappeared into the houses it was occupation after invasion then the duty commences for the conquered to show themselves gracious toward the conquerors after some time as soon as the first terror disappears a new calm is established in many families the prussian officer eats at the table he is sometimes well bred and through politeness pities france and speaks of his repugnance in taking part in this affair one is grateful to him for this sentiment then one may be some day or other in need of his protection by treating him well one has perhaps a less number of men to feed and why should we wound any one on whom we are entirely dependent to act thus would be less bravery than temerity and temerity is no longer a fault of the commoner of rouen as it was at the time of the heroic defense when their city became famous finally each told himself that the highest judgment of french urbanity required that they be allowed to be polite to the strange soldier in the house provided they did not show themselves familiar with him in public outside they would not make themselves known to each other but at home they could chat freely and the german might remain longer each evening warming his feet at their hearthstones the town even took on little by little its ordinary aspect the french scarcely went out but the prussian soldiers grumbled in the streets in short the officers of the blue hussars who dragged with arrogance their great weapons of death up and down the pavement seemed to have no more grievous scorn for the simple citizens than the officers or the sportsmen who the year before drank in the same cafes there was nevertheless something in the air something subtle and unknown a strange intolerable atmosphere like a penetrating odor the odor of invasion it filled the dwellings and the public places changed the taste of food gave the impression of being on a journey far away among barbarous and dangerous tribes the conquerors exacted money much money the inhabitants always paid and they were rich enough to do it but the richer a trading norman becomes the more he suffers at every outlay at each part of his fortune that he sees pass from his hands into those of another therefore two or three leagues below the town 
following the course of the river toward Croisset, Dependal, or Bessart, mariners and fishermen often picked up the swollen corpse of a German in uniform from the bottom of the river. Killed by the blow of a knife, the head crushed with a stone, or perhaps thrown into the water by a push from the high bridge. The slime of the riverbed buried these obscure vengeances, savage but legitimate, unknown heroisms, mute attacks more perilous than the battles of broad day, and without the echoing sound of glory. For hatred of the foreigner always arouses some intrepid ones who are ready to die for an idea. Finally, as soon as the invaders had brought the town quite under subjection with their inflexible discipline, without having been guilty of any of the horrors for which they were famous along their triumphal line of march, people began to take courage, and the need of trade put new heart into the commerce of the country. Some had large interests at Havre, which the French army occupied, and they wished to try and reach this port by going to Dieppe by land and there embarking. They used their influence with the German soldiers with whom they had an acquaintance, and finally an authorization of departure was obtained from the general-in-chief. Then a large diligence with four horses having been engaged for this journey, and ten persons having engaged seats in it, it was resolved to set out on Tuesday morning before daylight in order to escape observation. For some time before, the frost had been hardening the earth, and on Monday, toward three o'clock, great black clouds coming from the north brought the snow which fell without interruption during the evening and all night. At half-past four in the morning the travellers met in the courtyard of Hotel Normandy, where they were to take the carriage. They were still full of sleep, and shivering with cold under their wraps. They could only see each other dimly in the obscure light, and the accumulation of heavy winter garments made them all resemble fat curates in long cassocks. Only two of the men were acquainted. A third accosted them, and they chatted. "'I'm going to take my wife.' said one. I, too, said another. And I, said the third. The first added, We shall not return to Rouen, and if the Prussians approach Havre, we shall go over to England. All had the same projects, being of the same mind. As yet the horses were not harnessed. A little lantern, carried by a stable-boy, went out one door from time to time to immediately appear at another. The feet of the horses striking the floor could be heard, although deadened by the straw and litter, and the voice of a man talking to the beasts, sometimes swearing, came from the end of the building. A light tinkling of bells announced that they were taking down the harness. This murmur soon became a clear and continuous rhythm by the movement of the animal, stopping sometimes, then breaking into a brusque shake which was accompanied by the dull stamp of a sabbat upon the hard earth. The door suddenly closed. All noise ceased. The frozen citizens were silent. They remained immovable and stiff. A curtain of uninterrupted white flakes constantly sparkled in its descent to the ground. It effaced forms and powdered everything with a downy moss, and nothing could be heard in the great silence. The town was calm and buried under the wintry frost as this fall of snow, unnameable and floating, a sensation rather than a sound, trembling atoms which only seemed to fill all space, came to cover the earth. The man reappeared with his lantern, pulling at the end of a rope a sad horse which would not come willingly. He placed him against the pole, fastened the traces, walked about a long time adjusting the harness, for he had the use of but one hand, the other carrying the lantern. As he went for the second horse, he noticed the travelers, motionless, already white with snow, and said to them, 
Why not get into the carriage? You will be under cover at least. They had evidently not thought of it, and they hastened to do so. The three men installed their wives at the back and then followed them. Then the other forms, undecided and veiled, took in their turn the last places, without exchanging a word. The floor was covered with straw in which the feet ensconced themselves, the ladies at the back having brought little copper foot-stoves with the carbon fire, lighted them, and for some time, in low voices, enumerated the advantages of the appliances, repeating things that they had known for a long time. Finally, the carriage was harnessed with six horses instead of four because the traveling was very bad, and a voice called out, "'Is everybody aboard?' And a voice within answered, Yes. They were off. The carriage moved slowly, slowly for a little way. The wheels were embedded in the snow. The whole body groaned with heavy cracking sounds. The horses glistened, puffed, and smoked. And the great whip of the driver snapped without ceasing, hovering about on all sides, nodding and unrolling itself like a thin serpent, lashing brusquely some horse on the rebound, which then put forth its most violent effort. Now the day was imperceptibly dawning. The light flakes, which one of the travelers, a Rouenese by birth, said looked like a shower of cotton, no longer fell. A faint light filtered through the great dull clouds, which rendered more brilliant the white of the fields, where appeared a line of great trees clothed in whiteness, or a chimney with a cap of snow. In the carriage, each looked at the others curiously, in the sad light of this dawn. At the back, in the best places, Mr. Lousseau, wholesale merchant of wine, of Grand Pont Street, and Mrs. Lousseau were sleeping opposite each other. Lousseau had bought out his former patron who failed in business and made his fortune. He sold bad wine, at a good price, to small retailers in the country, and passed among his friends and acquaintances as a knavish wag, a true Norman, full of deceit and joviality. His reputation as a sharper was so well established that one evening, at the residence of the prefect, Mr. Turnell, author of some fables and songs of keen satirical mind, a local celebrity, having proposed to some ladies, who seemed to be getting a little sleepy, that they make up a game of Lousseau tricks, the joke traversed the rooms of the prefect, reached those of the town, and then, in the months to come, made many a face in the province expand with laughter. Lousseau was especially known for his love of farce of every kind, for his jokes, good and bad, and no one could ever talk with him without thinking, He is invaluable, this Lousseau! Of tall figure, his balloon-shaped front was surmounted by a ruddy face surrounded by gray whiskers. His wife, large, strong, and resolute, with a quick, decisive manner, was the order and arithmetic of this house of commerce, while he was the life of it, through his joyous activity. Beside them, Mr. Carre Lamadon held himself with great dignity, as if belonging to a superior caste. A considerable man, in cottons, proprietor of three mills, officer of the Legion of Honor, and member of the General Council. He had remained during the Empire chief of the friendly opposition, famous for making the Emperor pay more dear for rallying to the cause than if he had combated it with blunted arms, according to his own story. Madame Carré la Madame, much younger than her husband, was the consolation of officers of good family sent to Rouen in garrison. She sat opposite her husband, very dainty, petite, and pretty, wrapped closely in furs and looking with sad eyes at the interior of the carriage. Her neighbors, the Count and Countess Hubert de Breville, bore the name of one of the most ancient and noble families of Normandy. 
the count an old gentleman of good figure accentuated by the artifices of his toilet his resemblance to king henry the fourth who following a glorious legend of the family had impregnated one of the de breville ladies whose husband for this reason was made a count and governor of the province a colleague of mr carre lamadon in the general council count hubert represented the orleans party in the department the story of his marriage with the daughter of a little captain of a privateer had always remained a mystery but as the countess had a grand air received better than any one and passed for having been loved by the son of louis philippe all the nobility did her honor and her salon remained the first in the country the only one which preserved the old gallantry and to which the entree was difficult the fortune of the brevilles amounted it was said to five hundred thousand francs in income all in good securities these six persons formed the foundation of the carriage company the society side serene and strong honest established people who had both religion and principles by a strange chance all the women were upon the same seat and the countess had for neighbors two sisters who picked at long strings of beads and muttered some potters and aves one was old and as pitted with smallpox as if she had received a broadside of grape shot full in the face the other very sad had a pretty face and a disease of the lungs which added to their devoted faith illumined them and made them appear like martyrs opposite these two devotees were a man and a woman who attracted the notice of all the man well known was cornered at the democrat the terror of respectable people for twenty years he had soaked his great red beard in the box of all the democratic cafes he had consumed with his friends and confreres a rather pretty fortune left him by his father an old confectioner and he awaited the establishing of the republic with impatience that he might have the position he merited by his great expenditures on the fourth of september by some joke perhaps he believed himself elected prefect but when he went to assume the duties the clerks of the office were masters of the place and refused to recognize him obliging him to retreat rather a good bachelor on the whole inoffensive and serviceable he had busied himself with incomparable ardor in organizing the defense against the prussians he had dug holes in all the plains cut down young trees from the neighboring forests sown snares over all routes and at the approach of the enemy took himself quickly back to the town he now thought he could be of more use in havre where more entrenchments would be necessary the woman one of those called a coquette was celebrated for her embon point which had given her the nickname of ball of fat small round and fat as lard with puffy fingers choked at the phalanges like chaplets of short sausages with a stretched and shining skin an enormous bosom which shook under her dress she was nevertheless pleasing and sought after on account of a certain freshness and breeziness of disposition her face was a round apple a peony bud ready to pop into bloom and inside that opened two great black eyes shaded with thick brows that cast a shadow within and below a charming mouth humid for kissing furnished with shining microscopic baby teeth she was it was said full of admirable qualities as soon as she was recognized a whisper went around among the honest women and the words prostitute and public shame were whispered so loud that she raised her head then she threw at her neighbors such a provoking courageous look 
that a great silence reigned, and everybody looked down except Lousseau, who watched her with an exhilarated air. And immediately conversation began among the three ladies, whom the presence of this girl had suddenly rendered friendly, almost intimate. It seemed to them they should bring their married dignity into union in opposition to that sold without shame. For legal love always takes on a tone of contempt for its free confrere. The three men, also drawn together by an instinct of preservation at the sight of Cornudet, talked money with a certain high tone of disdain for the poor. Count Hubert talked of the havoc which the Prussians had caused, the losses which resulted from being robbed of cattle and from destroyed crops, with the assurance of a great lord, ten times millionaire whom these ravages would scarcely cramp for a year. Mr. Carre Lamadon, largely experienced in the cotton industry, had had need of sending six hundred thousand francs to England as a trifle in reserve if it should be needed. As for Lousseau, he had arranged with the French administration to sell them all the wines that remained in his cellars, on account of which the state owed him a formidable sum which he counted on collecting at Havre. And all three threw toward each other swift and amicable glances. Although in different conditions, they felt themselves to be brothers through money, that grand Freemasonry of those who possess it, and make the gold rattle by putting their hands in their trousers' pockets. The carriage went so slowly that at ten o'clock in the morning they had not gone four leagues. The men had got down three times to climb hills on foot, they began to be disturbed because they should be now taking breakfast at Totes, and they despaired now of reaching there before night. Each one had begun to watch for an inn along the route, when the carriage foundered in a snowdrift, and it took two hours to extricate it. Growing appetites troubled their minds, and no eating-house, no wine-shop showed itself the approach of the Prussians and the passage of the troops having frightened away all these industries. The gentlemen ran to the farms along the way for provisions, but they did not even find bread, for the defiant peasant had concealed his stores for fear of being pillaged by the soldiers who, having nothing to put between their teeth, took by force whatever they discovered. Toward one o'clock in the afternoon, Lousseau announced that there was a decided hollow in his stomach. Everybody suffered with him, and the violent need of eating, ever increasing, had killed conversation. From time to time someone yawned, another immediately imitated him, and each in his turn, in accordance with his character, his knowledge of life, and his social position, opened his mouth with carelessness or modesty, placing his hand quickly before the yawning hole from whence issued a vapor. Ball of fat, after many attempts, bent down as if seeking something under her skirts. She hesitated a second, looked at her neighbors, then sat up again tranquilly. The faces were pale and drawn, Lousseau affirmed that he would give a thousand francs for a small ham. His wife made a gesture as if in protest, but she kept quiet. She was always troubled when anyone spoke of squandering money, and could not comprehend any pleasantry on the subject. "'The fact is,' said the Count, "'I cannot understand why I did not think to bring some provisions with me.' Each reproached himself in the same way. However, Cornudet had a flask full of rum. He offered it. It was refused coldly. Lousseau alone accepted two swallows, and then passed back the flask, saying, by way of thanks, It is good all the same. It is warming and checks the appetite. The alcohol put him in good humor, and he proposed that they do as they did on the little ship in the song, 
eat the fattest of the passengers. This indirect allusion to ball of fat choked the well-bred people. They said nothing. Cornadette alone laughed. The two good sisters had ceased to mumble their rosaries and, with their hands enfolded in their great sleeves, held themselves immovable, obstinately lowering their eyes, without doubt offering to heaven the suffering it had brought upon them. Finally at three o'clock, when they found themselves in the midst of an interminable plain, without a single village in sight, Ball of fat, bending down quickly, drew from under the seat a large basket, covered with a white napkin. At first she brought out a little china plate and a silver cup, then a large dish in which there were two whole chickens cut up and embedded in their own jelly. And one could still see in the basket other good things, some pâtés, fruits, and sweetmeats. Provisions for three days if they should not see the kitchen of an inn. Four necks of bottles were seen among the packages of food. She took a wing of chicken and began to eat it delicately, with one of those little biscuits called Regents in Normandy. All looks were turned in her direction. Then the odor spread, enlarging the nostrils and making the mouth water besides causing a painful contraction of the jaw behind the ears. The scorn of the women for this girl became ferocious, as if they had a desire to kill her and throw her out of the carriage into the snow, her, her silver cup, her basket, provisions and all. But Lousseau, with his eyes, devoured the dish of chicken. He said, Fortunately, Madame had more precaution than we. There are some people who know how to think ahead always. She turned toward him, saying, If you would like some of it, sir, it is hard to go without breakfast so long. He saluted her and replied, Faith, I frankly cannot refuse. I can stand it no longer. Everything goes in time of war, does it not, madame? And then, casting a comprehensive glance around, he added, in moments like this, one can but be pleased to find people who are obliging. He had a newspaper which he spread out on his knees, that no spot might come to his pantaloons, and upon the point of a knife that he always carried in his pocket, he took up a leg all glistening with jelly, put it between his teeth, and masticated it with a satisfaction so evident that there ran through the carriage a great sigh of distress. Then Ball of Fat, in a sweet and humble voice, proposed that the two sisters partake of her collation. They both accepted instantly, and without raising their eyes began to eat very quickly, after stammering their thanks. Cornadette no longer refused the offers of his neighbor, and they formed with the sisters a sort of table by spreading out some newspapers upon their knees. The mouths opened and shut without ceasing. They masticated, swallowed, gulping ferociously. Lesseau in his corner was working hard, and in a low voice was trying to induce his wife to follow his example. She resisted for a long time. Then, when a drawn sensation ran through her body, she yielded. Her husband, rounding his phrase, asked their charming companion if he might be allowed to offer a little peace to Madame Lousseau. She replied, Why, yes, certainly, sir, with an amiable smile as she passed the dish. An embarrassing thing confronted them when they opened the first bottle of Bordeaux. They had but one cup. Each passed it after having tasted. Cornadet alone, for politeness without doubt, placed his lips at the spot left humid by his fair neighbor. Then, surrounded by people eating, suffocated by the odors of the food, the Count and Countess de Breville, as well as Madame and Mademoiselle Carré, 
Lamadon, were suffering that odious torment which has preserved the name of Tantalus. Suddenly the young wife of the manufacturer gave forth such a sigh that all heads were turned in her direction. She was as white as the snow without. Her eyes closed, her head drooped. She had lost consciousness. Her husband, much excited, implored the help of everybody. Each lost his head completely until the elder of the two sisters, holding the head of the sufferer, slipped ball of fat's cup between her lips and forced her to swallow a few drops of wine. The pretty little lady revived, opened her eyes, smiled, and declared in a dying voice that she felt very well now. But in order that the attack might not return, the sister urged her to drink a full glass of Bordeaux and added, It is just hunger, nothing more. Then Ball of Fat, blushing and embarrassed, looked at the four travelers who had fasted, and stammered, G Goodness knows, uh, if I had dared to offer anything to these gentlemen and ladies, I would— Then she was silent, as if fearing an insult. Lousseau took up the word. Ah! Uh, Certainly in times like these all the world are brothers and ought to aid each other. Come, ladies, without ceremony, why the devil not accept? We do not know whether we shall even find a house where we can pass the night. At the pace we are going now, we shall not reach totes before noon tomorrow. They still hesitated no one daring to assume the responsibility of a yes. The Count decided the question. He turned toward the fat, intimidated girl, and, taking on a grand air of condescension, he said to her, We accept with gratitude, madame. End of Part One